build something that matters. What could matter more than the education of children? Specifically, STEM education. The brain is the last great frontier in biology and physiology. Most of the grand questions in physiology still revolve around the brain. What is consciousness? Why do we have emotions? Why are nervous systems so diverse? How can I remember something with vivid detail that happened years or even decades ago? Most neurological diseases are incurable and few have effective long-term treatments. All of this means that we need the next generation of scientists, engineers, healthcare workers, and informed citizens to push the boundaries of neuroscience knowledge. Every young kid has an innate interest in science, nature, and engineering. That's where all the why questions come from, little kids. They want to understand what they're experiencing with their senses and how it fits into and builds on their existing framework of knowledge. The problem is that all too often formal education sucks all the fun out of science. We're so worried about memorizing facts and standardized test performance that many kids lose interest in STEM disciplines as they move through secondary education in their college years. As they get older, we know that two-thirds of students who enter college as STEM majors fail to graduate as STEM majors. Sometimes this is because they found something else that they are truly passionate about, maybe in addition to STEM. But many educational studies have shown that it's due in large part to frustration or boredom with the traditional way that science is taught through lectures and uninspiring labs. We at NeuroTinker are here to change that with our NeuroBytes technology that lets students and lifelong learners learn about the nervous system by building their own nervous systems. So what we see here are four NeuroBytes. And by themselves, they don't do anything unless you actually power them up. So we're going to power up one of our NeuroBytes with our power cable here. And what you see is that the LED turns green. That indicates that that NeuroBytes is at rest, right? resting memory potential, similar to, similar to what happens in real neurons when they're at rest. We're adding a stimulator into one of the sockets, an inhibitory socket here in the neurobytes, and it turns blue, indicating we've gone more negative from that resting memory potential, farther away from actual potential firing. Uh, we actually need two excitatory stimulations to fire action potentials in neurobytes, much like real neurons, you need more than one. So I'm going to take that stimulator, put it into an excitatory socket, it goes yellowish, orangish. Um, again, we need at least two inputs to fire an action potential, two excitatory inputs. So I'm going to add another stimulator into an excitatory socket, firing action potentials, flashing that bright white LED indicating that that cell is now above threshold firing an action potential. It can send that information to another neurobytes now. So I'm plugging in an axon cable into um, axon on neurobytes number one and an excitatory socket on neurobytes number two. It's sending voltage information from one to two and you can see now we've got a little bit of an increase in resting memory potential. It's yellowish orange on the second one. But again, still below threshold, we need a second input. So here's our stimulator bringing us above threshold, bright white firing of the LED indicating yes, action potential there too. Another axon, let that cell talk to the third one, plugging in right now to the excitatory socket. That'll give us a little bit of a bump in the normal resting memory potential, but again, we need two excitations. So I'll come in with another stimulator, Plug that in, there's our third action potential. Bang, 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 bang. There's our action potential pattern. Another axon cable to an excitatory input on number four. It brings us closer to threshold there. We need to add the stimulator to get us above that threshold level to fire action potentials. Plug it in right here. Now we've got this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four action potential pattern firing in these neurobytes. Much like what you see in a ring oscillator in a real nervous system. There are um, many nervous systems that have this kind of arrangement for basic uh, motion properties for central pattern generating. So what I'm doing here is plugging that axon from 4 to 1 into an inhibitory socket and what you'll notice is that that normal pattern changes right about here. There's a little hitch. So you saw instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, it actually stopped for just a fraction of a second. That inhibition from number 4 to number 1 at exactly the same time that 1 was trying to fire canceled it out, it blocked it out, so that ring stopped firing for a second. You block that motor pattern, the breathing, the walking pattern, whatever it was. So you can use this kind of technology to model different diseases, for instance, that you would see in central pattern generators. Now I'm going to take that inhibition from number four and uh, to one and actually move it to an excitatory socket of number one. So we have three action potentials, three excitations, changing that normal action potential pattern in this ring, much more chaotic. Right? So again, alterations to the pattern, maybe it has something to do with seizure, 
you're losing that normal pattern of excitation and more random firing around this ring or around this nervous system. Again, something that can be modeled by students using our, our Neurobytes technology. So now I'm going to remove one of the exciters from uh, Neurobytes number one back to two sources of excitation and we get back to that normal one, two, three, four patterning um, in that ring oscillator. So we removed uh, the third influence which removed the random firing around that ring. So hopefully this has given you a little bit of insight into the power of our Neurobytes simulators, right? They're very simple tools can be used to learn about basic properties of neurons, of electricity, but the really cool thing is that students can hold these in their hands, get a sense of how and what happens when they connect them together into any pattern. It doesn't have to be this ring pattern. Anything their imagination comes up with, they can connect together to see how these nervous systems would operate um, in a much more dynamic way than you'd ever learn about in a textbook or in a computer simulation on a screen, we think. One of the exciting things about Neurobytes is that we can interface them with the real world. So here you see a modified motor Neurobytes module um, directly outputting a uh, PWM waveform that can drive a hobby servo. Um, now we can take some continuous rotation hobby servos, attach them to a, uh, a suitable chassis, in this case an old cell phone box, um, along with a few sensors, and using standard Neurobytes as a brain we can build a little buggy. Um, now you can see it running around my living room and successfully making its way out of a primitive obstacle course. We can also use standard servos to simulate a variety of different limbs, uh, including in this case the knee-jerk reflex. Um, that you experience at a doctor's office uh, when, when you get your knee whacked with a little rubber hammer. Um, now in this case I've built a little three-axis cardboard arm and equipped it with a single touch sensor at the end um, and it shows basic compliance every time the tip of the uh, arm gets touched it jerks back and then moves back forward again so as I move my hand back and forth you can see the arm um, retracting and extending. Um, Another interface uses the standard Arduino touch sensor library on a, uh, a pro mini board that then directly talks to the Neurobytes and allows you to do more advanced touch sensing. Uh, you can see here um, probing the brain of the, uh, the arm with, uh, with my fingertip. You can see a reaction and then we can also use a modified me arm with a series of copper plates adhered onto it to, uh, to actually start behaving more like a real arm. Um, and you can see here some advanced behavior as well. Once I touch the arm enough times in the same spot, uh, you can see it shake back and forth, uh, kind of as if it didn't want to be touched anymore. Um, and we're looking at other sensors too. You know, we have, we have uh, infrared proximity sensors that directly interface with the, uh, with the platform. You can see as I lower this box onto the, uh, the sensor, it inhibits the firing of the neurobyte it's attached to. So what are the next steps? Well, we've been working on this for about 18 months now. Uh, first independently, and then uh, as of February of 2015, uh, Joe found Zach through the Hackaday project site, and we've been collaborating ever since. Uh, but we like to spend more time on the project. We want to uh, really put some serious thought into what features we want in version 5. Um, and we want to design that uh, next iteration from the start to be manufacturable in large quantity. So there's a lot of things that we want to change that we've um, learned both by playing with the platform ourselves, but also by exposing it to game designers and educators and students and hobbyists and friends and lifelong learners and um, pretty much every, anyone we can talk to at this point. If you want to learn more, you can head to our website, www.neurotinker.com. Uh, we also have a Facebook and a Twitter account. And uh, we'll be periodically updating this Hackaday project site as we continue to develop the platform. Thanks a lot.